everyone. This is Larry Mishkin. Welcome to another episode of the Deadhead Cannabis Show. My co-host, uh, Rob Hunt of Linne Holdings, is here from California. Rob, how are you doing today? I'm great, Larry. How are you doing today? You know, I'm doing great. Um, kind of nasty and overcast here in Chicago, but that's winter here, so we just get used to it. But lots of great stuff going on uh, music-wise, especially uh, good stuff today for us to talk about with the dead. In fact, uh, I know that you've got a clip queued up here for the show we're going to talk about. You want to give it a quick intro? Uh, sure. I think what we're going to be talking about today is you know a little bit of this day in, in, in history. From 215-1973, we're going to listen to a little bit of the Dane County Coliseum. And I think uh, we're going to start off today with a little bit of um, the jam and Here Comes Sunshine, uh, which had just come out right around this time. So, uh, you know, maybe fire that one up for a second. Great stuff, Rob. Great selection. So yeah, and you know that's uh, coming off of uh, "Wake in the Flood," which uh, was just about to be released. So this is predating it. A lot of the songs that were going on in that album were being uh, tested out. So you know the, the set list we're going to talk about today has quite a few of the songs you know from there, including um, you know "Eyes of the World," uh, "Here Comes Sunshine," and uh, a couple others. Good stuff. A good way to start the day off. Um, I was lucky enough to catch the uh, the breakout of Here Comes Sunshine when they brought it back in Tempe, Arizona. I believe in uh, December of nineteen ninety two or nineteen ninety three. So a song that I never thought I'd see, and then all of a sudden, you know, got it coming back out, and it was actually I got miracle that night uh, into the front row, where the person that gave me the ticket said, "Hey, if I give you this ticket, you know, you serious? You've no money? You're sure?" I'm like, he's like, "What if I told you it's front row?" I'm like, "Doesn't change the fact that I can't give you anything, you know, for us." I'm like, "I'll get you really high, but you know, that's about the, the most I can do." And they came back about 15 minutes later and gave me the ticket, and true to my word, I got them really, really high. <laughs> so uh, it was a, a lot of fun, but every time I hear that song, I think about that, that great day of coming down from Salt Lake City where it was frigid cold into the, um, the, the Phoenix heat and uh, having a couple of really fun days at the, uh, I think it was um, Compton Terrace is where they had those shows. Yep, and then later on they came through Chicago that spring and they played it at uh, the lovely Rosemont Horizon. And, uh, of course, uh, I happened to be able to go that night with a good friend of ours. I want those. Those are the Ken Nardin shows. Yep, good friend of ours, Alex Wellens, was in town, and he got to go to the show with me. And somehow Alex wound up down on the floor 10 rows back, and I wound up in the upper deck with my wife and other people. You know, And we, we all got to hear the Here Comes Sunshine, and it was great, but he was, like, right in front of Jerry. And, uh, you know, Alex, is, as Jay can attest, is one of those kind of guys who can pull off that kind of stuff. And it's always fun to go to Grateful Dead shows with. But, uh, yeah, this is just a collection of tremendous tunes, and I look forward to talking about it uh, uh, in a little while. Um, well, Larry, you just you snuck it in there. we got a special guest today, so why don't you introduce him? I'm going to do it right now. We do have a very special guest today, a very good friend of our show, and a good friend of the uh, Grateful Dead community as a whole, Jay Blakesburg, who is... Uh, the official photographer of Dead and & Company and uh, quite a number of other bands of note. And uh, Jay, welcome to our show again. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, that you know, I'm a big fan of the 73 era of the Grateful Dead. Um, you know, looking at that set list from this show where you just played that that cut. Um, and I love, always loved Here Comes Sunshine. I love, I love listening to the, the, the studio album. I love listening to Wake of the Flood. I love the, that original pure eyes of the world. Um, such a great record. You know, it's funny because, uh, you know, I was, I was, I was up at Weir's house actually just a couple days ago. Um, I was interviewing him for a documentary that I'm working on. And, uh, and I was talking about Weather Report, and I was like, you know, when when you put out that record in 73, the songs that were in the charts were like um, Olivia Newton-John and Tom Jones <laughs> and Rod Stewart, you know, stuff like that, like two and three minute songs. And you put out this record that's got this 13 minute or whatever it is, you know, Weather Report. And I had him talk about, you know, if asking him if he was listening to popular radio at the time if that was an influence and he said yeah 
he had been back then he did listen to everything that was going on but they just sort of followed their own muse you know like if they wanted to make a 13 minute song and put it on a record that's sort of what they did you know you also have to remember that um was it wake of the flood was that the first record that was on grateful dead records um was that the first release was it wake of the flood mars hotel and Blues for Allah, are those the three Grateful Dead records that came out on Grateful Dead records? So if it was, Wake of the Flood was the first one. It, it is and it was. You're, you're spot on, Jeff. Yeah, and so, uh, um, you know, they also didn't have to answer to, you know, Joe Smith at Warner Brothers or, or anything like that. They could, they could, they could, you know, travel on their high frequency. And, um, you know, another interesting story, I, I recently connected with um, uh, the guy who uh, created uh, Grateful Dead records for the band, and um, he was a photographer back in the 60s and had like a thousand photographs of the Grateful Dead from 67 to the early 70s that have been in storage for 55 years that nobody's ever seen that I have recently rescued and scanned and uh, will make their debut sometime in the near future in some different projects that I'm working on. So, you know, Ron's a very elderly, great gentleman and... Uh, he, he trusted me to give me all these these incredible photographs that when you see them, they will blow your mind. Um, you know, another funny story when I was up at Weir's place, you know, the documentary is about deadheads and the war on drugs and me and the band. And, you know, Bobby, I said to him, I go, we're, I was asking him about how how important the documentation by the tapers and, and photographers were, and, you know, and are going to be in, in telling the story of the band. And he was saying, you know, in two or 300 years, he believes, and I do too, that uh, people will still want to know about the Grateful Dead. They will still be being talked about, right? As long as we don't do something stupid to blow our planet up. <laughs> and, um, uh, and so, you know, I was kind of going down this road of, of a photography kind of questioning to him. And I said, you know, Bobby, you, you know, you've said to me, you know, several times over the p recent years, you know, oh, Jay, don't you have enough photos of me already? And uh, and I, when I said that to him, he laughed. And then I said, you know, I always wanted to say this back to you, Bob, but I n always hold my hold my tongue. And that is, um, haven't you played me and my uncle and Sugar Magnolia enough times? Um, right. And he laughed at that. And I said, I said, listen, you know, every time you play those songs, you want them to be the best version you've ever played. Every time I take a new picture of you, I want it to be the next, uh, I want it to be the, the best picture I've ever taken of you. And so that's why I don't have enough pictures of you, Bob, because I'm always trying to get a better photograph of you than the last one that I took. Like you're always trying to play a sugar mag that's better than the last one. So he, he kind of laughed at that, that, that analogy. Now let me ask you, Jay, uh, recently though, didn't you have a chance to shoot uh uh, Bobby and his daughter at the uh, big uh, formal that they go to. Uh, yeah, I did go to the debutante ball with the Weir family. And I guess a few of those, uh, some videos maybe popped up with me in the background that his other daughter Monet posted. So, but you know, that's so, sort of like personal stuff that they do with their family. So I probably don't really want to talk about it. You know, like I haven't posted any photos from it, but let's just say it was a really very cool, elegant evening with tuxedos and, and ball gowns and, and, uh, and white gloves and white gloves. And, I, I and, love Bobby with the white gloves. That's all I'm going to say. And, and, and Bob did a great job and uh, uh, Chloe did a great job and they did their debutante coming out and, and uh, I was there to photograph it all. So, um, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a lovely evening. Well, mazel tov to the weirs. That's very exciting. That's a good time. <laughs> I got to say, going back to what you were saying earlier, I certainly hope that, you know, Bobby was listening to Tom Jones back then because you can't really beat a, uh, uh, you know, what's new pussycat back in 1973. So, you know. Right. Well, also, you know, did you ever see the clip of um, Tom Jones sitting in with Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young uh, on the Tom Jones cell? Oh, go on YouTube and watch it. It's amazing. It's, you know, Tom Jones, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young and Jones, you know. And uh, definitely, definitely worth checking out, you know. So um, easy, easy to find on YouTube. But yeah, you know, great, great music. You know, of course, Tom Jones was unbelievable. You know, what's not to like about about um, Tom Jones? If yeah, if you get a chance, 
The John Mulaney, the comedian, does a great bit about what's new Pussycat that's absolutely hilarious where he and his buddy go into a, um, a diner and play that song over and over and over again on a jukebox like 20 times in a row until people start to lose their minds and then just to really get them. He plays one, it's not unusual to throw it in there just to mix it up. And everyone's like, oh, thank God, there's no more what's new Pussy, Pussycat. And then he puts back what's new Pussycat for like the next 20 songs. <laughs> and the, the bit, the bit, if you're a John Mulaney fan, is absolutely, it's funnier than the whole Trump like horse in the hospital bit. It's amazing. Sounds, sounds pretty funny. I don't know that. I'll have to go and look for that on YouTube. That sounds like a good one. But yeah, this 73 show looks pretty, pretty stellar. You know, got a nice eyes, of the, a dark star eyes of the world China doll. You know, that's pretty smoking. Um, you know, and Uncle John's band, of course, Here Comes Sunshine. Great first set with Bertha playing China Rider. Road Let me ask you this. You know, the, one of the things that drew me to this tape early on and, and you know, kind of taught me the significance of different eras of debt is that for some reason, 1973 only, they play this up-tempo version of They Love Each Other. Have you ever, But it just seems they only play it in 73. And then from that point forward, it's always back to the more traditional version. Right. A little bit slower. Yeah. Right. And I never understood what motivated him to do it just because I love that up-tempo version. Yeah, I don't, I don't really, I don't know the answer to that either. And and they play the China Riders without the crescendo and the transition jam. Right. Mm, the missing crescendo. But I'll, I'll tell you what else I really like about this is, I, you ain't woman enough, right? Because it's, it's like such a great song for Donna to sing, that's you know I think really well suited for her, and she belts it out really well. And I just, I love that song on there. That's always one of the highlights of that tape. Yeah, I gotta go. I gotta go check it out. I don't. I can't even picture that song in my head. So I. Uh, well, lucky for us, we have a clip of it. So, uh, Dan, you want to pop in just a, uh, a quick segment of that as well? Straight honky tonk Garcia. I was just gonna say it's like a honky tonk version of Terry Garcia. It's awesome. I love that, and I love it. That's Tammy Wynette's tune, isn't it? I, I think that's right. Yeah, I think that's right. And Donna, but it's you know, I, mean, I know people have their feelings about Donna, and you know, there's I don't love everything she does. I recognize the significance she played in Grateful Dead history, but I love it when they play a cover tune just for her. And she just you know just and Jerry's back there jamming away, and she's belting it out. I love that. Yeah, of all the things that she was singing as a um, a song just by herself, uh, that's one of my favorites from that era. And it, it, I can't think they played it more than probably seven or eight times, maybe less. That's always the problem, you know. They get these great tunes, and you know they play them a few times, and boom, they're gone. But you know, it was fun for her, and it was always fun to listen to. And I think that all the uh, women deadheads out there always appreciated, you know, a good Donna tune thrown in like that every now and then, just to show the feminine side of the Grateful Dead, as it were. Now, Jay, do you ever have any uh, uh, dealings with Donna? Not really anything super close. I mean, obviously photographed her, and she sat in with Dead & Co. a couple summers back at a couple of stadium shows. I remember. And, you know, we chatted a little bit, but, you know, I don't really know Donna. She doesn't really know me, but, uh, you know, I was a fan of, of some of the stuff that she did. You know, back in the day, it was, uh, you know, some cool, some cool stuff. Uh, you know, I started my... Grateful Dead trajectory in the Keith and Donna years, um, you know, saw the band only a hand. I mean, the first time I saw, well, I saw the Jerry Garcia band before the Grateful Dead, and that was with Keith and Donna in the band. Uh, then English Town, and then Giant Stadium, and then uh, the Capitol Theater, eleven twenty four seventy eight, the the Deadhead only show where Garcia had the flu and laryngitis. Um, there might have been one other show. No, that might be it. I might have only seen Keith and Donna three times. So wait, you, you saw JGB before you saw The Grateful Dead. Where did you see JGB? Asbury Park Convention Hall. So you grew up in Jersey then? Yeah, July of 77. Yeah, I'm a Jersey boy, man. Awesome. So did you catch any of those um, those DC shows in 78? Did you catch like Warner Theaters or any of that stuff? That was no, like? no, no, no. No, I mean, 78, I was still... You know, I was 15, 16, you know, I was still a youngster. I And, and I, uh, my, ber my birthday's late. I'm a December baby. So December 78, I turned 17. So you saw English Town as a 16-year-old? As a 15-year-old. 
That's sick. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome, man. Yeah. Um, As a first show, yeah, pretty decent. Yeah, a lot of, lot of, lot of people. First show for a lot of, lot of East Coast, you know, metropolitan area deadheads. You know, Philly, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut deadheads. It was the English Town was the first for sure. Well, that was like the only show they played out there that summer, wasn't it? They worked on the East Coast a lot. Yeah, you know, if you remember, you know, uh, Mickey had a car accident um, a f- shortly before English Town. And Donna had some sort of surgery. You know, Donna sits on a stool for most of English Town. And Mickey had, if I remember correctly, I think Phil told me this story. Mickey drove his car into a tree, but not like into a tree, but into like the branches of the tree up high, like off like a like a raised area with a tree down below, like a like a driveway that was along a big slope. And it, and this Porsche like ended up in a tree or something like that. And just like, it like, like, like John Candy and uh, the Blues Brothers launching into the truck. Yeah, something like that, if I remember correctly. But so there were some injuries. But I mean, you know, for for anybody who's hasn't listened to ever or in a long time, you know, English Town '77, um, just go put on the the He's Gone Not Fade Away jam. You know, it's I believe it's 40 minutes long. You know, I think each of them clock in at like 18 or 19 minutes, something like that. But the the transition jam in between that he's gone, not fade away is beyond epic. It is probably one of my most fit. And I didn't realize it at the time when I was 15, but probably one of my most favorite pieces of live Grateful Dead music um, and there obviously are so many incredible ones out there, but you know, if you haven't given it a listen in a while that he's gone, not fade away, that is, is stellar, stellar, mind boggling, stellar. So, so, so I'm still trying to come to terms with the fact that you saw a JGB show that before you saw a Grateful Dead show, cause I, I saw my first JGB show after four times of seeing the Grateful Dead. So I saw my first dead in September of 88 and I saw my first Garcia band on September 5th, 89. Right. So I guess you're, you're, guess you're not as cool as me. Is that what you're saying? No, but, but, but definitely, definitely. But that, that, that goes without saying uh, I'm not as cool as anyone. Right. So, um, but, but more to the point, like I didn't know any of like JGB like tunes. Like when I first went to see JGB, I just assumed that he was going to play like, you know, half dead songs. And it was a brand new experience. And ultimately I became a much bigger Garcia band fan than I was even a Grateful Dead fan, you know, by like, I, I didn't right. miss JGB shows after like 93. Sugary was the only song I knew. Yeah, I mean, Deal is the only song I knew, right? It was, uh, other than that, it was... Right. Uh, maybe I knew Deal also, and I think they played it at that show. But, you know, I, I, had a, I had a friend who was, you know, the same age as my brother and sister, so two years older than me, and his name was Lozzy, L-O-Z-Y, you know, uh, that was his nickname because everybody had nicknames in the 1970s. Um, when you smoked a lot, as much pot and did as much acid as we did, you had to have a nickname. <laughs> and um, uh, anyway, so uh, he his mission in life was to turn me on to music. And uh, he took me and um, I think Nikki Katsanis, maybe one other person down in his Carmen Ghia to Asbury Park. I didn't drive. I was 15, but he was 17. He had a car. And he got the tickets. They were front row seats all the way over to the side in front of Keith. But um, and, he, and we brought a camera. I don't know whose camera. It had a 50 millimeter lens. And we took a we passed it around and we all took some photos on it. And we got back and developed the roll of film and went into a dark room at a, another friend's from high school's house. And and we got two two photos that were all, almost in focus and almost exposed properly. And we made some five by sevens and thumbtacked them to our bedroom wall and I watched Jerry come up in that magical, mystical, um, cancerous developer, and uh, and and uh, I was hooked forever. You know, at that very moment. And, and that was the July 9th, nineteen seventy seven show. Is that right? Or is yeah, it... yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. That's okay. I'm looking at the list now. It's sick. The uh, harder they come opener. It's uh, looks really good. Uh, did they play deal? Did they play deal that night? I'm not seeing it. The list I'm seeing right now is a Harder They Come, Midnight Moonlight, Russian Lullaby, Tore Up, Knockin', Tangled, Not Fade Away uh, is what I'm what I'm seeing. But let me see if I can get the whole thing. Is there a, sh- is there a sugary in the second set? Yeah, yeah. There's a sugary in the, to actually open the uh, the first set. Sugary, Stop That Train, That's What Love Will Make You Do, Simple Twist, Sitting in Limbo, Mystery Train, How Sweet It Is. Yeah, I remember the Tangled Up in Blue also because we were like, oh my God, he's playing a Bob Dylan song, you know. and, and uh, Well, I figure you know the Jimmy Cliff tunes as well, right? For the Sitting in Limbo and the Harder They Come. Yeah, probably Harder They Come for sure. Maybe Sitting in Limbo. You know, again, we were 15, right? So we were, you know, we were limited to what we heard on the radio or what we had in records or what our siblings had in records. And 
you know, so, you know, we didn't have, we didn't have the type of music that we have today at our fingertips. Um, no, same. The first time I saw the Garcia band in 83, I think the only tune he played that I knew was Dear Prudence, right? Uh -huh. you know, everything else was, I was like, wow, I didn't even realize there was this whole side of Garcia away from the dead. And, you know, th that was a, an eye right. opener. Yeah, we used to joke back in, the, back in those days that, you know, Jerry would start doing a solo. He could go, you know, go to the bathroom, get a beer, or come back, and he'd still be playing the same solo. But I never wanted to miss the damn solo. That's why, it's exactly. Exactly. That's why I love Garcia Band. You know, there's nothing else to us split away. Of course, but that's why I never went. That's why I never went to the bathroom or, nor got a beer because I don't want to miss that solo. But that's, that's why. I, that's why I never missed a Warfield show. You know, when I realized I could like get my dinner and then stand you know five feet away from Garcia and just watch licks all night, where like I didn't have to worry. Like the the, the only thing that you might get is that it got passed over to Melvin for a few minutes. You know, and that to me was the greatest thing in the world. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So, Jay, tell us about uh, playing in the sand. You made it down there. I did make it down there, you know, because I work down there. Um, I do, uh, in, in a normal year, I shoot for the band, obviously. And I also uh, do my slideshow, my Grateful Dead slideshow storytelling presentation. And I also set up a photo gallery as like an attraction for the fans to come in and, and check out, you know, cool art another thing to do um and uh cid is very gracious to host me with all of that yes yes is that burka that's setting that up with you or is that uh is that well it was originally yeah originally it was berkowitz but berkowitz is no longer involved in cid so but still a dear friend and love dan and miss dan uh very much uh but anyway so you know i got down there a couple days early because i have to prep and get ready and you know dial things in and so i was there when everybody else got the news on the, that same day and you know, saw all the rumors on the internet that, you know, a bunch of people posted that, you know, probably should just shut up. But, you know, people have that addiction to social media and feel like they have to be the first to, to tell something. And, um, you know, I was sad and shocked and, you know, upset. But listen, we're they tried to do a large scale concert in the middle of a global pandemic and we all knew the risks and we all knew the rewards. And unfortunately the risks outweighed the rewards this time. And, uh, you know, the band or CID or together or whoever it was, I don't really even know, you know, decided in the interest of the health and safety and welfare of the fans and the band and the crew and the staff that playing in the sand couldn't happen, you know? So, uh, I think once that initial shock wore off of everybody that was already there, you know, there were people coming into from the airport still. There were people at the airport. I know some people that just like immediately heard about it and they went to, you know, somewhere else. They went to Cozumel or, you know, they went and rented an Airbnb somewhere. They just stayed in, 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 in Cancun or whatever. But, you know, the people that were on site, we all were very sad and bummed out. And then we just started moving forward and said, all right, let's enjoy each other's company and let's make, you know, lemonade out of lemons. And, and uh, CID set up this, uh, you know, this year the venue was cool. So they moved it to the other side of the beach and then the venue came down the beach and then it jogged off into this little courtyard area between two of the housing buildings over at the Sunshine Resort. And so it was all fenced in, so it was part of it. And they had craft beer and craft cocktails and craft churros and craft, burritos and snacks and tacos and you know and they also had a giant video screen there with a killer sound system so so actually you know if the show had gone on and you wanted to hang out in that area not be on the beach you had a video screen that was you know 15 feet across by 15 feet high or whatever and uh, you know a full-on sound system you know concert grade sound system so you could you know get away from the beach or whatever and still see it and hear it and, uh, and so that's where my gallery was going to be this year. And, you know, we packed everything up at first and we took everything out of frames and put it back in boxes and, you know, called it a day and then started talking to the guest services people. And, and they were like, maybe you should do your gallery. Let's, you know, maybe people would be enjoy it. And they were going to start like showing videos on those screens on the, that first week, you know, they were going to do, try and do some programming. And so they were getting some live music that they were, you know, pumping through the sound system and people were dancing and hanging out and having craft beers and craft cocktails. And I had my gallery open. So people got to come in and check out some artwork. And, and, uh, and then I said to the guest service, and then a lot of people started saying to me, are you going to still do your slideshow? Well, my slideshow was scheduled to happen indoors and we didn't feel like it would be safe to do it indoors. So there are a couple of outdoor stages by a couple of the pools 
um, at the Nizuk uh, Resort is where like uh, the late night bands would be playing. And at the Sunshine Pool, there's a stage with a giant screen. And I said, can we do it outside there? I bet you people would love to come. And so, uh, you know, they, they talked to the hotel and they got the projector out there and they set it up. And an hour before I was supposed to start, it started pouring rain for 15 minutes and my laptop almost fried and, and, uh, and, uh, we got it dialed in and, you know, three, 400 people showed up and I got to do my slideshow. And so, you know, people got to have a little bit of grateful dead energy. And, and, uh, and then at the end of it, I joked that I thanked everybody for letting me headline playing in the sand. No, that's great. And, and I got to tell you, I could think of a lot worse fates than being stuck for a week in Mexico with a bunch of deadheads and, you know, being able to go and like see some, my kid a few years ago drove out to, uh, uh, where was it? Um, uh, to see Curveball up in upstate New York for fish. And they canceled the show as they were driving into the parking lot. Nobody let them hang out. They had to get the hell out of there and go home. Yeah, well, they let you hang out, and the NCID paid for your room. Like you basically, except for your flights and your, you know, your ground transportation back in the states, you essentially got a free vacation, and you could stay if you had a five night package. You could stay for five nights. If you had a two week package, you could stay for two weeks. You could do whatever you want. So they were very generous. <clears throat> it was all very sad and terrible. But CID, you know, I, there was a lot of bashing at first. Um, because there's a lot of grumpy deadheads who hide behind computers. And a lot of the bashing came from people that weren't even there, weren't even going, because that's what we always see on, online. And I have to say that, you know, the CID people did everything that they could to still try and make a good event or a good experience for the fans. And, and, I, and I, you know, I, I tip my glass to them because they really care about their customers. You know, they're not like a fly by night organization. That's just like a, you know, go screw yourself. They really care about their customers and they did what they could to do the right thing. You know, there's nobody to blame. CID is not to blame. The band is not to blame. The band members is not to blame. The global pandemic is what is, is to blame. And there's nothing that anybody can do about it. So, so we were right to assume then there was CID that ultimately made the decision and not the band itself. I don't know the answer to that. I think it was a joint decision, but I don't really know. Um, I, I, maybe, I think, I, I don't really know the answer to that question, unfortunately. But it was the right decision, you think? Boy, was it the right decision? Well, yeah, John had COVID, so that played a part. Billy, Billy was still having health issues. I, I, I'm not the one to say if it was the right decision or the wrong decision, because obviously widespread panic played in Mexico a couple of weeks later and Wilco and Brandy Carlisle and, you know, Hootie the Blowfish and, and all these other shows are happening. But you have to remember that when we were there in Mexico that first week in January, that was the peak of Omicron. OK, and there were still unknowns about Omicron, how bad it was, how much it was going to affect you, whether it was long term whether people were going to get sick, whether people were going to get hospitalized. You know, you're in a foreign country and nobody wants that liability. Nobody wants, you know, and, and our fan base, you know, look at all of us on this Zoom here. We're all like, you know, combined. We're like a thousand years old, right? You know, the, 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 the four of well, us. Maybe Dan, I don't know. Right. But, uh, but you know what I mean? It's like, you know, the fan base in general is people that are 50 and up. And, uh, you know, we're at risk at our age for, for, for COVID and, so, you know, the health and well, well, welfare of the audience was important. Again, I don't know who actually decided to cancel it, and it doesn't matter. We were, you know, in Mexico at the peak of the pandemic, uh, or that, that variant, the Omicron, and, and somebody had to make a call, and that was the call they made, and, you know, and we all have to live with it because there's no going back. And do you do any of the other uh, shows down there? Do you do any of the Cloud9 Presents uh, events? I don't do any of the Cloud9 stuff, no. And, um, no, just Dead & Co. It's the only one that I've done so far, so. Hey, Jay, is there any uh, insight you know or you can share with us about Billy's health and how he's doing? I mean, just what everybody else knows, you know. Um, I hear he's doing okay, you know. I'm sure he's taking it slow. I'm sure he's not out there, you know, rehearsing or pounding on, you know, the drums every day. I'm sure he's trying to get as healthy as he possibly can so that he can continue to play music for many, many more years, which is what we all want. We want Bill Kreutzmann to be healthy. You know, that's really the, the, you know, that's the bottom line is that, you know, these guys can get out there and play more music together because we all want it. We all miss it and we all want to experience it. How do you feel the, uh, that Dead & Co is playing right now? When was the last time you heard them? I guess at the Hollywood Bowl, Halloween. You know, I saw 
one show on the East Coast, the tour opener in Raleigh, and then I saw the tour closer in the first half at Wrigley, both great nights. And then I saw, maybe was it just the tour closer at the Hollywood Bowl? Oh, and then at Red Rocks, of course, I went to Red Rocks. I had a great time. I thought they were playing great. I thought that um, Jay Lane did an amazing job of stepping in. Do you guys remember the story early on in, in around 2016, early on in Denica, where Bob did an interview maybe with Billboard or somebody, and he talked about how he had this vision where he was floating above the band, behind the band, and, and he was looking down, and, and there were different musicians, and there was different players, and different drummers, and different, you know, front person singing his songs. And he, ba- you know, it's funny, because I did a photo shoot with Bob a few weeks before that interview, and he told me that same story in the photo shoot. And then, uh, you know, he, 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 he told it publicly, I think it was Billboard or Polestar, one of those, and uh, essentially that's what Bob and these guys think is that this movie, this, this music lives on with Dead & Co., you know, with a revolving cast. Maybe, you know, maybe Bill Kreutzman retires at some point and the other band members don't and maybe Jay Lane becomes a member. Then maybe maybe Bob retires and somebody else replaces him, but John and O'Teal and Jeff are still there and, you know, maybe O'Teal moves on and, you know, who knows what. Like, you know, it's all... You know, but I think that the songbook, as we all know, is legendary and it will continue on with all sorts of different tributes and hopefully Dead & Co. Will, will continue on as well. Uh, but, you know, the the bowl shows were great. Um, everything I saw, I, you know, I, I loved every minute of it. Did you happen to catch any of the Phil shows at the Capitol Theater in October? Uh, I did not because I was too busy with stuff on the, on the West Coast, including Dead & Co., and uh, it was just too crazy, and I couldn't I couldn't get to these coasts. It's the first cap shows I've missed in a while. Yeah, I was at the uh, first three nights with the quintet, and uh, yeah, I mean, I was so sad to miss the quintet. Just, but you know, I mean, every time I see them, I it just blows me away. I mean, you know, a tremendous experience, a lot of fun to see those guys, and uh, I was really glad to have a chance to get out there. Um, one other quick question for you: What's your thoughts on this uh, new Scorsese project and Jonah Hill playing Jerry? Uh, I think that I should play Jim Marshall in the movie. <laughs> Do you know who Jim Marshall is? Has anybody approached you for that yet? No. You know who Jim Marshall was? Photographer. Yeah, legendary photographer. Um, you know, shot the, li- the live dead photo on, you know, the, the Hate Street photo. He, he shot the Johnny Cash photo. The iconic uh, flipping you off. Yeah, it's one of the great What's, ones. Yeah, the Johnny Cash flipping the bird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, no, nobody's approached me. I, you know, I don't, I have no, you know... Sure. Cool. Great. Can't wait to see it. Let's see what happens. You know, I mean, I have no idea. Um, but yeah, you know, I think uh, it'll be interesting. You know, like the Elton John biopic is great and the Queen one was great. And so hopefully they won't mess this one up. And um, it'll be cool and interesting, you know, to see Jonah Hill play young Jerry Garcia. Does Bobby have any thoughts on it? I didn't ask him. I have no idea. Oh. Okay. No idea. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, it should be should be interesting, and uh, hopefully it'll all happen. Who knows? You know, these things take a long time to. Uh, I don't know if they even have a screenplay yet. So I'm guessing most of those decisions were made by Red Light and by Trixie and Annabelle. Uh, for that movie? Yeah. I I, I I don't see that being true. You think they would approach the band to uh, to? Uh, they had to approach the band. It's not a it's not a Jerry Garcia biopic. It's a Grateful Dead biopic. They the band had to agree. It can't just be the Garcia state. I mean, if it's a, Gar- a a Garcia documentary, then it would be Trixie and Annabelle and Red Light Management. But no, if it's the Grateful Dead, it's Bob and Phil and Mickey and Bill and an activist. Yeah, you know, it's 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 their it's their decision, not just the Garcia state on, on the, uh, at least that's what I would well, think. We, we've been pontificating over here. Who's going to get the nod for all the other featured roles. Yeah, obviously Joan has been announced, but you know, for us it was like, who's going to get everyone, all the other supporting cast roles. So there's going to be probably some really cool ones. Right. Woody Harrell said as Bob Weir. Is he? No, I don't know. Oh, oh, he could. He could pull it off. Right. I have, I have pictures of Woody Harrelson singing with Bob Weir on stage at a, at a, at a 420 Earth Day gig in the in San Francisco, a free concert, and back in 
I don't know, two th- mid 2000s. Well, I'll tell you, Dan uh, this week sent around a clip of uh, a very clean shaven and tuxedoed Bob Weir playing with Chuck Berry at his introduction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah, I saw that. That's, I love seeing that, you know, but he's kind of trying to figure out what his place is on the stage. And, and you know, Chuck defers to him and let him jam for a few minutes. I thought it was great. I loved it. Yeah. D- doesn't yeah. Uh, Woody live like right next door to Bill down in Maui? No idea. For some reason, I think those two have houses like really close to each other. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. So tell, what's your next big project, Jay? So, well, I was just going to say, I got to, I got to jump here because I got to get on a, a call here shortly. So I'm just finishing up a new book. During the pandemic, well, I got two things. One is the documentary film, which is what I mentioned earlier, and we're very far along on that. And my son is directing that, and I'm producing it. And I did all the interviews and. Uh, um, you know, we interviewed Mickey for it also and, and, and some other interesting people. I won't give too much away, but uh, hard at work on the documentary. And uh, my daughter, Ricky, during the pandemic, she asked if she could start a new Instagram page for me called Retro Blakesburg. And Retro Blakesburg's premise is that it's only photographs that I shot on film. And she curates it 100%. She, you know, she does it. I don't have any input into it. She won't let me have any input in it. Um, every once in a while I suggest a photo that would be cool. And she usually tells me to go fuck myself. Um, but, uh, but she says it in a polite way cause I'm her father. So, Oh dad, go fuck yourself. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, so anyway, so somewhere along the way in the pandemic, she said, why don't we do a book on retro Blakesburg? So we have a new book coming out called retro Blakesburg, the film archives, volume one. And it's a big book. It's 312 pages. Wayne Coyne from the Flaming Lips wrote the forward. Michael Franti wrote the introduction. I wrote some uh, extended. It's it's broken up by decades. So I wrote a 2000 word essay for the 70s, the 80s. And then I think my 90s and 2000 essays are about 1500 words each. Uh, so I wrote a, you know, I wrote a good 7000 words for the for the book. And then uh it's got a lot of photographs in it with some captions. And then I wrote some extended captions on some stuff and uh, we're going to hopefully send that to the printer in about two to three weeks. Wow. So we've been working on it for a year and a half. Nice. And it's finally ready to, you know, we've been waiting, we were waiting on the forward and the introduction from Michael Franti and, and Wayne Coyne. Cause you know, those musicians, you know, musicians always take a little bit longer to get things done. And uh, especially when they're doing those favors for people like me. Uh, but they did get them done, and 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 my next call that I got to do here shortly is with my editor, who is doing the final edit proofreading of my 2000s essay, which is the last element for the book, and then we will uh, put it into pre press and get it all dialed in, and it will go to the printer, and it will come out officially. I guess the release date will be sometime in September of 2022. Can people pre order? Uh, not yet. Not on the website yet. We're going to do a limited edition version of the book, and that will be able to pre-order. That will probably be the only one that will, people will pre-order. And uh, so this is way, way advanced publicity because this podcast will will be airing soon. Um, well, we let us know when it comes out so we can pump it up on the show and let people know to, uh, to go pick it up. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, I'll, co- I'll come back on and I'll talk to anybody. I'll be a complete media whore. And talk to everybody about my book. But the other... I was going to say, if you're dying to send an autographed copy to anyone, you know, you've got welcome recipients on, a, on the other end of this podcast. <laughs> so, I have a couple of Jay Blakesburg autographed books in my living room right now. I do too. I've got one right there. One one per media outlet. So you guys are going to have to like fight in like the lion's den over it to the, to the death. Uh, Larry always kicks my ass. I can't win that right. fight. And then the other book that I'm working on right now is I'm doing a book called Illegal Images, The History of Blotter Acid Art. And I'm doing that with a guy named Mark McLeod, who owns the Blotter Acid Art Museum here in San Francisco, uh, also called the uh, Institute of Illegal Images. And um, we are making a coffee table book on the history of blotter art. Um, so that's another big project that and that one will uh, in theory come out in the fall of 2023. So a year after retro retro Blakesburg will be fall 2022. And then for the fall of 2024, I'm going to put out another Grateful Dead project that I'm just starting to get into. But uh, it's going to involve and include um, 
mostly unseen or rarely seen photographs of the Grateful Dead. And believe it or not, you know, like, because everybody's seen all my photos of the dead and Bob Minkins and Ed Perlstein's and Herbie Green and Jim Marshall. I've been reaching out to uh, people and finding um, uh, old collections of Grateful Dead photographs um, that uh, have been sitting in attics and basements for decades and decades, you know, like, like you might have brought a camera to a show in, you know, in, in, in college in 74 and uh, took some pictures and you found your negatives, or your slides, and I want them and we're going to put them in this book. Um, I just, uh, uh, about a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, the Jerry Garcia Instagram page and the Grateful Dead Instagram and Facebook pages, they posted a photograph of David Crosby jamming with the Grateful Dead at the Fillmore West in August of 1970. And that photograph came from me. And I discovered an archive of a, of a woman named Elizabeth Sunflower. And, um, and uh, I'm working with that archive now and with my daughter. And uh, I discovered that photo and I sent it to David Crosby's archivist. And he's like, oh, my God, who gets to release this to the world? And I said, go ahead and send it out as a tweet. And he tweeted it and everybody picked it up and it got a lot of attention. So we're finding stuff like that. So um, the Instagram for that stuff is is uh, on Instagram only is Retro Photo Archive, at Retro Photo Archive. And we're just starting to post stuff on there. So things like that from the Elizabeth Sunflower Archive and some of this other stuff that we're discovering and finding in long lost crevices will end up on, on retro photo archive. And that website will pop up in about maybe six or eight weeks. Uh, the retro photo archive website, doc, retro photo archive.com. When the, uh, uh, recent St. Louis box set came out, uh, a story got out of St. Louis was popularized of the dead showing up at a bar mitzvah at a hotel, uh, that was right across the, uh, right across the street. And uh, we were lucky enough to get one of the band members who had been uh, playing there uh, to come over and, and uh, on the show. And, you know, he was outlining the whole experience to us. And it was amazing. But I thought of you and I'm like, photographs, there's got to be photographs. Turns out the Bar Mitzvah boy's mother had a whole box full of photographs and her house burned down. Uh, uh. She had photographs of all of it, of all of them up there. They were all there in there except for Garcia. This was what vintage seventy one or seventy two Grateful Dead. So that so that 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 St. Louis box set. Um, there are six photos, I believe, in it by a photographer named Alvin Meyerowitz, which are also part of my retro photo archive. And I was the one who got them from Alvin, also an archive that had been sitting dormant. He's a, a eighty year old man uh, in San Francisco, and I. I uh, got his photographs and um, got got them to Rhino, uh, and Rhino used six of them in that St. Louis box set. So uh, yeah, so that's that's you know some of the projects I'm working on is is trying to find these these archives of uh, people that shot photographs. So a, a guy named Mark Jaffe, which is funny because my stepbrother's name is Mark Jaffe, but uh, a guy named Mark Jaffe contacted me out of the blue, and he had a, a roll of color film that he shot of the dead in I think '81 in Pittsburgh and the Garcia band in 80 in New Jersey and sent me the color slides and said, you know, they're just collecting dust at my house. Why don't you store them and archive them and scan them? And I scanned about eight or 10 of those shots. And, you know, they're, they're fun, cool, you know, moment in, in history that otherwise would have just been sitting in a, in a slide box with nobody to enjoy them ever. So they'll end up on the retro photo archive Instagram page also. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Jay, Thank you so much for your time today. I, you, and even the few extra minutes you've given us here, you are a busy guy. We appreciate the time and all the information you share with us. We will look forward to seeing these books when they come out. And you're always welcome to come on anytime and promote the hell out of them. Uh, we love that too. And that'll be a lot of fun. Um, at the end of this month, I'm going to be in Southern Cal with uh, Alex and Andy and others. And uh, we always have a good time sitting outside around a fire uh, with a big fatty of the new Garcia strain, which I think is really, really good, telling uh, Jay's stories. So I look forward to that as well. All right. Well, I'm having dinner with Andy and Alex tonight. Um, for those of you that are wondering who this mysterious Andy and Alex are, they're old deadhead friends of Larry and 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 maybe Rob. I don't know. It sounds like you knew Alex also back in the day. Uh, but they're my neighbors here in San Francisco, and we've known them for – my wife and Alex have known each other for – 40 years and I've known Andy and Alex. Andy is the girl. Alex is the boy. In fact, she was the first guest we ever had on this podcast. Yeah, we've had Andy on. She's, she's terrific. Yeah, and Andy has a cannabis business here in San Francisco and she is the exclusive distributor in, the, in San Francisco for the Garcia strain. 
um, the handpicked Garcia thing. So, yeah, so we're going over there for dinner tonight, so I'll tell them you guys said hi. Please do. And, and not that I, you know, I see them every day walking the dog anyway. <laughs> so I can, I can say hi today, tomorrow, the next day. That's the nice thing. Um, anyway, well, well, thanks for for having me on, and, and thanks for not smoking so much weed that you couldn't talk you know, on the show because this is the Deadhead Cannabis Show and I know you guys just sit around puffing big vape pens and joints all day long and do nothing else with your lives. You're basically, right, you know, like old stoners. Um, and I will, and, and of course you guys know I'm joking even though Larry's lighting up, but, uh, um, and, and full disclosure here, I have not smoked marijuana since 1981. So thanks for having me on the Deadhead Cannabis Show from a non-cannabis user. And uh, love you guys, and peace out, and thanks for having me, and we'll catch you next time. You got it, Jay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. That was amazing having Jay on. Uh, you know, it's the first time I've actually been on the, uh, the show when Jay has been a guest, so I've been looking forward to that for quite some time. It's nice to have a guest back up here, Larry. It's been a while since we've uh, you know, started doing guests. We've got quite a few lined up, I think, uh, for the next couple of weeks. You know, should we talk some weed? Should we talk what's going on in the cannabis world? We, we should, but I just want to circle back on that and say you're right. Uh, Jay Blakesburg is just a treat because, you know, you get guests on, sometimes you have to prompt him and this and that, and boy, Jay just, he starts and he dives right in, and the good part is everything he says is what at least I as a deadhead always want to hear about. So, you know, anytime we can get him on the show and we can get him going like that, I, I, that's a real win for us. So I'm really happy for us and for our listeners and, uh, Good luck with all of his books, and they're all great. If you haven't bought any of them yet, you should, because they're all fantastic, and I'm sure these new ones will be really good. Yeah, I was actually flipping through one of his books um, you know, while we were speaking here at the end of having him on, and so many great pictures from the, uh, the Fairly Well book that he did of the five nights between Levi Stadium and, uh, and Chicago. But uh, you know, I was telling him before we, we started the podcast today that uh, quite a few shots of, of friends of mine, and there's a couple shots that I absolutely love of you know, a lot of the guys I've worked with in the music industry that are all all together uh, in one spot. There's one of like, you know, Benji Eisen and, and uh, Mark from Red Light and uh, Pete Shapiro and Dan Berkowitz and, uh, you know, you name it down the line, all in one picture together, uh, which is, you know, Don Strasberg from, uh, from uh, AEG Live out in Colorado. But it, it's great when you get an opportunity to get all the people in the industry into one room at the same time where, you know, none of them ever get to hang out together because they're all in different, um, different regions that once in a while something is so big, just the magnitude is so large that it pulls them all together to go, we got to be at that one. I think that's true. I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, and it's great that you can capture those images. But I have to tell you, I, I'm not going to be able to wait till 2023 or four, whatever it is for that blotter acid art book. I want to see that. That's going to be something, I have to tell you. Well, we can always, we can always raid Jim's well, fridge, you know, if uh, <laughs> we want the advance. Well, okay, <laughs> maybe so. But, uh, you know, back in the day, I, if, to me, that was always half the fun was what was the design on the blotter, you know, and some blotter was great. And, you know, you get these great designs. And Well, do you remember the album covers? The album covers used to be the best. Where like the entire yeah, we never got album covers. Ah, so in, instead of like you, you know, obviously if you buy a sheet, that's like a hundred hits. But if you actually buy a full page, it was with, you know the thousand hits that had the border and everything around it. There was ones that had the full album covers of classic, you know, like Hendrix and Stones and Beatles. Like there was a you know someone was putting out blotter paper in like the mid to late eighties. That was just you know these massive album covers right around the same time that Goonie Birds and like the uh, the Blue Jets were popular. But uh, but you know super super cool. <laughs> Those I did not see, but, you know, we, we, we saw them all from, you know, the Orange Sunshine and uh, Felix the Cat and just on and on and on. They were, it was always fun. It was always very uh, interesting. Just, oh, Felix, okay, thanks. And off you go. So, cool. That'll be a fun book. Yep. Well, I, just don't, I don't think it's nearly as prevalent as it used to be, so I'm glad that someone's actually, you know, doing a, a, a retro on it, but... You know, compared to the days of the mid '80s, where you know doses were a buck a piece in the lot, as like those days are so gone at this point, and I think the whole the whole jam band scene's moved on to Molly. I think that's true. You know, judging from the folks uh, who go to those shows that I know, not naming any names, um, but uh, although I'm surprised because I still see a little bit of this. Uh, younger generation, let's just call it, uh, where a lot of them still do enjoy acid, and uh, if they can find it, yeah, I mean, like, yeah. I don't think it's a question of desire. I think it's a question of accessibility. It used to be that you know, like, I mean, you you know, guys would have like you know grams of, of, of needlepoint fluff that were laying out sheets and bathtubs in hotel rooms, and you know, I, I haven't heard and seen that in years. No, that's true. Not at all like that. But you know, I I, I think like anything else, it. it uh, to the extent it makes it here to the Midwest, 
it probably tends to mostly flow out of the uh, New York area. But, you know, who knows? That's, uh, I guess that's where you have to go these days. Well, well hey, now that psychedelics are all getting legalized after cannabis, the next, the next battleground, so they say. We'll see whether or not it happens. I'm not nearly as bullish on that as I was about cannabis legalization. But, hey, let's talk about legalization because uh, we got some, some big news maybe this week. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, again, the sixth time the House has passed the Safe Banking Act. And this, this time, it's a, I feel like it's like a, a bad Hollywood sequel. It's like, safe six. This time it's different. You know, it's uh, <laughs> you know, and, still produced by Ed Perlmutter. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this time you've got Perlmutter, you know, as we discussed previously, saying this is his, you know, his last dying wish before he leaves the House. But uh, and you've got, you know, Schumer now coming out saying that, you know, he's going to put out legalization, uh, you know, new legislation on 420. And you've already got McConnell coming back going, oh, well, you know, there's a major issue with uh, with overdoses from, you know, from opiates. And the Democrats' response is to legalize cannabis. You know, OK, it's like whatever nonsense, you know, twist on on uh, or spin that McConnell wants to put on anything that he that he does, uh, you know, this one is is slamming the Dems for doing something that actually had massive bipartisan support. So, you know, we'll see. But I, I, you know, I, I spent some time with a, an investor in the space named Todd Harrison. Uh, I'll plug Todd for saying he's a pretty well-known investor in the space, and he's got his finger on the pulse of what's going on. And I spent um, a, a day in a car with him last week, and he's spending a lot of time on this effort. And, you know, when it came up, what did I think, you know, as far as legalization, I just shot it down unequivocally saying there's, you know, it's not going to happen. He's like, this time I think, you know, I think this time is different. I think you're wrong. And, you know, a day later, sure enough, they, they did pass it. Um, but, you know, still remains to be seen whether or not this can get tacked on. So I mean, we've beaten this horse to death. So, you know, I think the uh, the idea at this point is let's just wait and see. But is there anything worth discussing about Schumer's new bill? Or, you know, do you think it's doomed to, to die the same slow, painful death that every other Senate bill that's out there is? I, I don't think that any bill that's put forth by a Democrat has a chance of passing right now, so long as the Democrats don't have a clear uh, veto-proof uh, uh, majority in the uh, in the Senate, you know they they can't stop a filibuster, and so as long as they can't stop a filibuster, McConnell, you know he's he's the classic politician. You know we even see it on his comments on Trump, and not to to f- focus on that very much, but you know he speaks a tune entirely different than what the rest of the Republican Party is speaking. And on the one hand, we can certainly praise him and say, "Thank God somebody's telling the truth." On the other hand, for him, it's all about business, and you know that he he's just looking and, to. Continue. And thirteen months and two days late. Well, there's that too, of course. I won't deny that. Right. But um, look, I, it, it's a shame. And, 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 you know, I think there's ways for McConnell to say no, thank you without, you know, getting into all this, you know, nonsense about, you know, trying to pollute people's minds with marijuana. You know, we're a little beyond that, Mitch. And, you know, he knows this because uh, he was a big proponent of the, the Farm Bill of 2018 that completely legalized hemp and all of its constituent cannabinoids. And guess what? One of the constituents cannabinoids in hemp is THC. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. So, by the way, Mitch, you already legalized cannabis. You just didn't realize you were doing it. But thanks for that. Right. Exactly. So, you know, he'll he'll. It's just Mitch being Mitch. But I think that the answer is not right now. Um, and I just don't see how it, it forges a path through the Senate as long as, you know, they can't even agree on what day of the week it is. So that's that's a problem. Yeah. And the other big piece of news I saw this week, which you know, big to some, not not to others. I mean, again, I think a lot of people on this podcast that listen to the show would much rather we focus on what's happening with the really cool boutique craft growers or very specific parts of the industry. And sometimes we get into the macro of what's happening with these big Wall Street companies. But um, Merida, which is a, a private equity fund run by my buddy Mitch Barukowitz, uh, just did DSPAC a SPAC that um, uh, used Leafly as its uh, combination company. So it married the capital from the SPAC with Leafly as the uh, as the qualifying transaction, and they actually just despac it. So congrats to the Merida team and to Mitch for, for getting that done. And Leafly now is um, is a public company. So, you know, when you think Privateer bought that company for, what, $7 million back in 2014? Was there, you know, just getting out of the gate before Privateer became, like, the big company before Tilray, before any of that, before Marley Natural, the first thing they do is buy Leafly. And, uh, you know, now Leafly is a standalone, you know, media um, giant in the cannabis industry. That and, you know, MJ Biz and, and Wheat Maps are probably the three that have really, you know, made good in this space. But, uh, but that's a, you know, as a media announcement, that's a pretty big one. It is a pretty big one. And, you know, maybe that'll change people's perceptions of, you know, Leafly. And, and you know, I, I'm guilty of it. You know, the, the only time I'm on Leafly is when I'm looking up a strain. And, you know, it'll it'll give me a pretty good idea of, you know, usually what uh, what kind of strain I have. And, 
and what type of effects I can expect, whether, you know, Indica, Sativa, any of that. And, and I appreciate that for what it is. But the, yeah, they killed that game. You know, like they're the ones that actually got out there and said, what information do people want? And every strain cross you can think of in the world is, is sitting on that site. Whether or not they've gotten every genetic right, they've certainly done like the best they can, like from like a Wikipedia perspective of trying to get out there and speak to the genetics guys and find out like, what is the genesis of this strain? What are the crosses that got us to where it is? And they've, I mean, like, that's no easy task to actually get that shit right. And, and you said it, it exactly, that's like, I couldn't have said it better. It is like a Wikipedia thing, right? Where, you know, I should know better, but I still thought, you know, I'll, I'll, oh, Wikipedia says this, okay, and I'll run with it. Um, but, you know, it, it, that's that's exactly what it is, and it's it's nice to see, and um, I, I, I love that about them. You know, I use that, and weed maps, although I find you don't really need weed maps very much anymore, at least my personal experiences, because most of the time you can, it, it's not hard to find the dispensaries anywhere. Yeah, it used to be IC Mag was the other like place you'd go for like you know breeders discussing stuff with breeders. You know, if you want sort of the the Silk Road of information uh, among growers, you know that was always a good place to turn to for you know tips on extraction, tips on cultivation. But even that, you know, like there's no really need for underground. You know, it's at this point it's up out in the open. If you want to exchange ideas, you know, no one's worried about the man knocking your door down anymore. So you know, good for Leafly for for kind of finding that niche early, and you know, good for Weed Maps and for uh, for some of these other groups doing the same thing. And obviously, like, none of them would be here, like literally none of them, but for high times, you know, from you know the seventies forward. So, you know, again, I think people always need to remember kind of who to pay the debt of gratitude to, and uh, in this case, you know, cannabis media. Uh, there, there's only one, and it starts and ends with high times. Yeah, I think you're right, and I think it, you know it's very important for those of us who grew up in the late sixties and early seventies. You know, high times was our first, you know, experience into, you know, anything other than all the whispered rumors about drugs and this and that. You get a copy of High Times magazine, you could go check it out. You could look at the centerfold, you know, and uh, although, ironically enough, I'm sure my mother would have probably been more upset of me looking at a centerfold of High Times than she would have been looking at a centerfold of Playboy magazine. Uh, they're, they're both sexy. Yeah, the, well, some, sometimes <laughs> they were. There's, there's no doubt about that. I, I certainly can't disagree with that. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I would agree with you about High Times and... Uh, um, it, it is important to remember those folks and the people who, who really got it started for the rest of us, and they've been there from the beginning. So that's great, too. Well, Rob, this has just been a great show. Uh, Jay's a great guest. We've got a great guest lined up next week, Scott Berman from the Panther Investment Fund. Uh, it's going to be a little more uh, uh, business-focused, but... Uh, well, don't don't always- scare our listeners off. Next week is going to be the best episode you've ever heard. Don't miss it. That's Well, that's what they were saying about Bob Weir and Jay, right? The next picture. And, and you're absolutely right. It's just a different... It'll be a, a different focus next week. But uh, uh, Scott is also a big deadhead, so I'm sure he'll have lots of good Grateful Dead stories to share with us as as we all do from time to time when we get together and, and have a chance to go over. And music-wise... Um, you know, great selection for today, Rob. This is, this is, I think, a lot of people's, uh, you know, in their top five, uh, certainly in mine, and, and, and uh, one of the very first uh, bootleg tapes that I got uh, that I just, I, I wore out listening to my senior year at Michigan in 1983, every 84, every road trip we went on, every time we were sitting around getting high, boom, that tape went in. Well, Dan, you're, you're, or Larry, you're giving me a lot of credit, I'll tell Dan. Larry's giving me credit for a show that, that he... Uh, pretty much picked out and said, what do you think of this one? I just endorsed it. So thank you for giving me the credit. What I will say is I did spring, you know, one other thing we're going to listen to before we, uh, before we head out today, which is something I don't think you'd ever heard before, Larry, which is a uh, K-San's um, uh, 1972 recording of Garcia and Merle, which actually has Bill Kreutzman playing in, uh, on the recording as well. But K-San in San Francisco once in a while would get artists into their, um, into their studio, into the actual, like, uh, um, you know, recording uh, studio within the, um, the, the FM broadcast station and would put different bands on to play, you know, stuff for the audience in San Francisco. And they got some fantastic artists over a period of time. But in this particular time, this is just when Jerry and, uh, and Merle Saunders were getting together and they played um, about 10 songs, I think, in the Pacific High Studios, which is, you know... First of all, I love FM recordings. Absolutely love them because they're so fat, right? They just have that really, really fat sound. Uh, and also, you know, this is one of the first times you got to hear what was you know, going to become just an amazing collaboration for the next, you know, seven or eight years. But, uh, but you know, when I sent this one over for you to listen to, I was really surprised when you came back and said that you hadn't heard it. And uh, super stoked. I mean, it's the 50th anniversary. We missed it last week. We should have put it on last week's podcast. But February 5th, 1972... Uh, was when this recording was, and it starts off with just a, a terrific, it takes a lot to laugh, takes a train to cry, despite the fact they played the last verse first and then came back to it. Uh, a super, super funky expressway. 
uh, a great that's the touch I like. Uh, and then a couple you know a couple random ones like Save Mother Earth, which I never heard them play after that. And then they played um, John Lennon's Imagine instrumentally, which is just absolutely beautiful. As we head out today, I think we're listening to a piece of that. But then some more uh, Dylan with that's or excuse me Elvis with that's all right, Mama. And then who's loving you tonight? Some more Dylan with that when I paint my masterpiece. Uh, then I was made to love her, Lonely Avenue, and how sweet it is to to finish it off. So eleven tracks. Uh, I think they've actually you know put it out there on some sort of bootleg tape at one point. But uh, if anyone out there has not heard it, uh, this is one that you should definitely be looking up. So again, it's Pacific High Studios, February the fifth, nineteen seventy two. And uh, and I know you had a chance to listen to it, Larry. I did, and it's fantastic. And and, and uh, that's a great introduction to it. And I think. Uh, this is probably a good time to let everyone know that although there's more Grateful Dead than we could possibly ever imagine listening to and talking about in an entire lifetime, uh, Rob and I have been talking for a long time about uh, starting to focus a little bit on the Jerry Garcia Band. I'm sure it's no surprise to anyone who listens to this show uh, that Rob and I are both huge fans of the JGB, and uh, this is a great opportunity to listen to it, but I would really, really urge our listeners uh, in particular to tune in two weeks from now uh, because we're going to be featuring a... Uh, 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 a Jerry Garcia show uh, from Keene College uh, back in 1980 uh, that I think many people, you know, will look at as one of the great Jerry Garcia band shows of all time. Uh, Eleanor Rigby after midnight, Eleanor Rigby. Or after midnight, Eleanor Rigby after midnight. Which alone is the reason to buy it, but the whole thing is just so good. And, and in fact, the dead released it commercially a few, well, not the dead, I guess, uh, the, the Garcia family, whoever releases Jerry's stuff. Uh, and that's That's been released for a little while now, but you can get it from Keene College and uh, it, it's just wonderful. So for people who are particularly interested in listening and talking about Garcia, uh, be sure to be listening two weeks from now. Yeah, and then before we go, uh, to all our fish friends out there, Trey just announced four dates uh, for TAB. So two nights in Boston, two nights in, uh, in Colorado, one at Red Rocks and one up at the Gerald Ford Amphitheater. So if you're in Colorado and you haven't had a chance to see that venue yet up in Vail, get your tickets as soon as you can because that's a fantastic place to see a band. Same place that... You know, the Jerry Garcia birthday band played a couple of years ago. I've seen some great shows there. Uh, I know the Wolf Brothers played there last summer. But, uh, you know, one of my favorite venues, and Colorado's got so many of my favorite venues, but I'd say, you know, between that and State Bridge and Red Rocks and uh, Mishawaka, you know, there's there's a handful of just, you know, Telluride uh, Town Park, some really special places in that state to see music, and uh, the Gerald Ford Amphitheater is definitely one of them. So happy to see that announcement. Excellent. Well, I'm going to sign off, Rob, and then I'm going to let you take us home with the... Uh uh, Garcia fine and I'm just going to sit back and listen to it so to all of our listeners thank you very much for listening uh, today have a great week and enjoy your cannabis responsibly Rob we'll see you all next week with uh, another fun show thanks to Jay Blakesburg for, uh, for being on with us thanks as always to our producer Dan Humiston and this is a little bit of the um, instrumental Imagine from Pacific High Studios on February 5th 1972 so with that uh, we'll see you next week looking forward to uh, lots of fun shows coming up and signing off here from California <laughs>